Let's welcome Dr. Magdalena Skipper. Hello, good afternoon. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I am so delighted that I chose the topic I chose, because if you remember back to the very beginning of our meeting here, there was a great parade of scientists over here, and one important figure was missing, and that was Darwin. So I want to invite you on a, a little journey, a journey back in time, 160 years ago. That is when Darwin wrote his book, The Origin of Species. And the reason why I chose this rather unusual anniversary is because, in fact, Nature, the journal that I am editor-in-chief of, is this year celebrating its 150th anniversary. In fact, just tomorrow. So when we were launched, The Origin of Species was 10 years old, and it was actually quite significant. But what I want, the journey I want to take you on is to consider what it is that we have learned since Darwin's time that would have energized Darwin so much in his theory. And of course, Darwin is best known for his theory of evolution. Originally, when The Origin of Species was published back in 1859, the very first edition of that book did not even contain the word evolution. It was only in its sixth edition that that word appeared. And in fact, the word first appeared in his second book, The Descent of Man, which he published um, a few years later. And certainly natural selection was far from being accepted as a mechanism for evolution until much later. And this is what I want to chart with you today. So, of course, many of you will know that the idea for evolution came to Darwin as a result of his voyage on the Beagle. Well, today, if you would like to see the Beagle, you can, in fact, yourself travel to the very southern tip of South America, to Punta Arenas, where one dedicated man actually built a life-size replica of that ship. It's remarkable to consider that on what is actually a very small vessel, Darwin and his colleagues spent almost five years. And it was, of course, on that journey as he traveled the world and he uh, took in um, the diversity of geographically isolated species that the idea of evolution occurred to him. The biggest tragedy, professional tragedy, of Darwin was he never, that he never met this guy. And this guy is Gregor Mendel. He was um, a monk uh, living in what today is Czech Republic. And in his um, garden, the monastery garden, he pe performed a number of experiments with garden peas. And as a result of these experiments, he came up with what we now understand as principles of inheritance. These principles um, that he developed were rather simple. He looked at a number of different character traits of these peas. I'm going to illustrate the principle just with one thing, and that's the color of the petals um, of these uh, peas. You can see here, this is a classic sort of inheritance um, uh, square. And what he noticed was that it was possible to take two uh, pink peas that had pink uh, petals, and if you cross them, the female and the male flower, you would actually get uh, this, this ratio of offspring in the next generation, that it was possible from two pink flowers to get, at a low frequency, uh, a white flower in this particular case. He didn't know about genes, he called them inheritance factors, but he indeed worked, indeed worked out that some of these inheritance factors had to be so-called recessive, so submissive, if you like. In this case, it's the white color of the petal, so that to be white, you would have to carry two copy of these factors, as he called them. But you could be pink if you only had one, so one pink factor was sufficient to make you uh, look pink. 
And indeed, just as the professional tragedy of Darwin was that he never met Mendel, Mendel never met Willem Johansson, who came up with the concept of the gene, and that it was only much later, in fact, Ronald Fisher, who was a mathematician and a statistician, who brought genetics together with statistics to create what we now understand as modern genetics and certainly population genetics. So all these things were falling into place. And the reason why I'm telling you about this is because, it, indeed, it would have helped Darwin enormously to advance his theory of, theory of evolution and, indeed, come up with a mechanism through which it acts. Um, so the, the final hugely important piece of the puzzle was, came with molecular genetics. In 1953, uh, Nature published, which is probably the most famous paper that it ever published, it was the stru structure of the double helix of DNA. And um, at that point, there was quite a lot of evidence already to suggest that DNA was, was the genetic molecule, was the molecule that underpinned, that encoded inheritance. But this was the real clincher. And the reason why it was the clincher is because the structure beautifully showed it, it, that the helix is, in fact, an anti-parallel helix. So if I demonstrate this with my hands, it will be something like this, but in a helical form. It actually automatically suggested how that molecule may self-replicate. And building on top of this, then we understood how genetics plays out in organisms' development. So from the, type, from the conception, from the zygote, through the organism's lifetime. I already mentioned population genetics in that context. Um, and then, of course, uh, the whole understanding of how mutations happen. Um, if you don't have change from one generation to the next, you can't adapt. But if you have too much change, too many mutations, then you cannot preserve these um, well-adapted, uh, beneficial um, uh, mutations and combinations of mutations. And so we understood that once we began to understand DNA repair and recombination. And finally, paleontology, so looking at uh, the um, remains, the, the, the record of organisms, animals and plants that are not, no longer with us, together combined to give us what today we describe as a modern evolutionary synthesis. And so with uh, confidence, we can now say that all evolutionary phenomena can be explained in a way that is consistent with known genetic mechanisms. That evolution is, in fact, gradual. At some point, it was considered that maybe it happened in leaps, because, for example, the uh, fossil record was punctuated. But that's not because that's how evolution pr progresses, but that's simply because that's what has remained and what we have uncovered. We now can say with confidence that it is natural selection, which is the main mechanism of changes, and even small advantages will make a difference. And we can say again with certainty that the object of selection is the phenotype, but in the context of the environment. And this is a very, very important point. And that evolutionary changes uh, need to be understood in the context of population, so not in the, just uh, on the individual um, in isolation. So this single most important piece of this puzzle that Darwin would have delighted in is, in fact, genetics. So what about it? Let's talk about genetics for a little while. When we talk about genetics, we sometimes talk about simple genetics and complex genetics. Well, it turns out that not so much of genetics is very simple. But I will give you one example. When we talk about simple genetics, we usually mean something that a trait, a characteristic, which is determined by changes or by sequence in only one gene, one part of DNA. So the picture shown here is, in fact, of an albino model. Um, albinism, so uh, inability to make pigment in your skin, in your body. Most forms of albinism are caused or are down to mutations in a single gene. But the, it turns out that there are very few traits, very few characters uh, that are determined by a single gene and single gene alone. And even then, when they're determined by single gene, um, there are the environment and other contributing factors play trick on that. And I'll show you a couple of examples in a minute. But here, in the cartoon form, I'm showing you 
probably the most uh, illustrative example of a complex trait, and that is height, or indeed body weight. Thousands and thousands of elements in your genome will come together to contribute to how tall you are. And of course, it, it probably does not need to be said, but your environment, how much food you have and what you eat, will also have an enormous influence on that particular trait. So I wanted to bring up gene editing in this context. I think everything I've said already is sufficient for you to appreciate how complex genetics actually is. So when people talk about gene editing, they talk about changing one gene, a, a small sequence in one gene with a form of molecular scissors, and many of you probably heard the word CRISPR, but there are other ways to do it, changing one gene to affect some kind of a phenotypic change, whether it's in disease or maybe uh, you've heard the term designer babies to come up with some kind of a desirable outcome. Well, if you heard anything that I've told you about, you will realize how difficult that would actually be because it's not that simple that one gene controls one particular character um, and also, if it, even if it did, what about the environment in which um, it played out? For that reason also, it's important to consider a difference between modifying the soma as opposed to the germline. So let me explain, in case that is not clear. So the germline are, for you, if you're a man, your sperm cells, and for me uh, and all the other ladies in the audience, our egg cells. They're very specific, and in our development, they're sort of put aside in a special place. The rest of my body is the soma, and the mutations, the changes in my soma, are not inherited to my children. So, for example, the moles I have on my arm or anywhere else on my body would never be inherited by my children. And so, for that reason, when we do think about genetic modification, for example, for therapeutic purposes, it is possible to consider that these advances could take place in some somatic part of the body, because they would be, they would be confined to only me, if that, indeed that treatment was um, done to me or any particular person. But it is that complexity of genetics and the context, which at least for um, a long time, as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, it, it makes it hard to imagine that germline engineering um, would make any sense at all. And so I promised you I will give you an example of further complexity, even with the so-called simple genetics. Now, this is a textbook example of so-called simple genetic trait. It's a disease, a metabolic disease called phenylketonuria, PKU. Uh, the mutation in one gene blocks a metabolic pathway. Individuals who carry that mutation are unable to metabolize a, one amino acid, a building block of a protein. As it happens, the mutation blocks the pathway at a stage, which uh, means that, that, that um, toxic substances accumulate, which leads to severe brain damage. Now, today, all over the world, newborn babies have a heel prick, a test, uh, for a blood test to detect whether they carry that mutation. The reason for this is that 100% penetrant, so 100% genetically caused disease by a simple single gene change can be 100% prevented by an environmental change, that is a change in the diet. The people who carry this mutation will be completely fine as long as they eliminate this amino acid from the diet. I want you to remember that to the end of the talk. Now, this so far may seem dramatic, but of course things are never quite as clear-cut in biology. So I want to tell you a couple of words about epigenetics. So epigenetics, um, relatively uh, new uh, field, um, refers to modifications chemical decorations, if you like, that sit upon the genome. Now, why do they matter? They matter because as they sit upon the genome, they will modify how the genome is interpreted by the cells. And this manifests itself both in health and disease. So a couple of illustrated example, illustrative examples. The first one, a very simple one is X chromosome inactivation. So these decorations on the genome 
Sometimes they only extend to a single gene or a single portion of the, of the genome, but they can affect a whole chromosome. So I, as a woman, have two X chromosomes. The gentlemen in the audience only have one, but most of the genes on the X chromosome have nothing to do with the fact that I'm a woman. They have everything to do with the thing, with ordinary things that both men and women do, uh, or, uh, body, our bodies have to do. So because I have twice as many of these genes, I need to shut them down. So in fact, this is uh, exactly what, what epigenetics, where epigenetics comes into play when it comes to the X chromosomes. In every single cell of my body, one of my X chromosomes is folded and shut down. And it, it happens through an epigenetic mechanism. And so um, a, a nice illustrative example of this, and some of you may be familiar with this already, is that of a cat. So a tortoiseshell cat, this particular coat color is determined by a gene who resides on the X chromosome of this cat. One of the versions of this gene encodes uh, black coat color and the other this sort of orange uh, ginger color. And you will see that this cat is all mottled. Different parts of its coat are black and, and others are, are ginger. And that is because randomly, in each individual cells, one of these X chromosomes was, de and, uh, was uh, deactivated, was shut down. Um, and so a tortoiseshell cat mottled like this can only ever be female. Now, of course, um, unfortunately, not all examples of um, epigenetic effects are this benign, if you like. Cancer is another example. Cancer is often thought of as the disease of the genome, but effectively it's also a disease of the epigenome. So in, in some cancers, what happens is that cells, which normally um, should be part of a, uh, an adult organ and function uh, in concert with all the other cells that surround them, these cancers lose their identity. They don't play ball, if you like, with the rest of the cells around them. And on some occasions, the reason the reason why this happens is associated with epigenetic changes. So the, the genome now has, um, is read out, is interpreted by the, um, uh, by the cell in a different way. So Darwin didn't know any of this. It would have helped him understand evolution much more. It would have helped him understand that natural selection was indeed the mechanism for it, the predominant uh, mechanism, it would have helped, me, helped him understand how organisms adapt to their environment. Uh, so, and, and in the story, the, this piece, this missing piece of the puzzle for Darwin, genetics was, in my opinion, the crucial thing that would have enormous, he would have benefited enormously from. Last century, there was um, a famous evolutionary biologist um, called Theodosius Dobzhansky, and this is probably the most famous quote from him. Um, he is often quoted as saying that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So I want to uh, extend or tweak this quote and say to you that nothing in evolution makes se sense in the, except in the light of genetics, and I will go further to say that nothing in genetics makes sense in the light of environment. And if there's anything that you, if there's only one thing that you remember from this particular presentation, that I'd like to, you to remember that genetics is far more complex than we had ever anticipated, and that it is far less deterministic than we ever imagined. Thank you very much. <laughs>